Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Number two, huh? Yes. Well, it gives us something to live for now. It'll be number one, right? Right. <laughs> Blackhead, yes, half sir. a million dollars and one year to record. Oh, somebody Woof. shortchanged you, bud. Let me tell you something. More like 15 months and $600,000. <laughs> so, so I've heard of a day late and a dollar short, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, $100,000 short at this point. I had, we had to rob our piggy banks to make this one. Yeah, I thought Very I'd it big up. piggy bank. <laughs> well, why does it take so much money to record albums? Because he kept screwing things up. <laughs> <No. laughs> I never, um, never show up in the studio. Really, it's like, you know, are you kind of, will you please come down today? You know, <laughs> no, no. Well, on your, on your album, you talk about political and world issues. Are you trying to get a point over the record? When we finished the, the circus tour, Inside the Electric Circus Tour, a couple of years ago, I got to a point where I just didn't have anything to say anymore. You know, either in interviews or, or even more importantly, musically. I, we, you know, we did songs like Animal and Wild Child and Blind Texas. It was all great songs, but we said that. And once... We said that, it's like, okay, if the Beatles did She Loves You, and they said that as best they could, what are you going to do? Keep trying to remanufacture the same songs over and over again. I mean, you end up being a parody of yourself, and a bad parody at that. If you don't change, then you just dry up and wither away. I mean, you have to say something new after a while. And what I was going through was things that had been boiling inside of me for a long time. I mean, my specific viewpoints about well, the album itself is called The Headless Children. And The Headless Children, if people think, you know, Wasp are running around lopping kids' heads off and things like that, it's n nothing like that at all. The Headless Children started out as being an anti-nuclear war song. And then the more and more I watched the news, it started dawning on me that that is what The Headless Children is all about. It's about any insanity that you see anywhere. And these are things that I've felt for a long time and just never said anything about it. And the more and more I started talking to fans, and viewing my my attitudes on things like drugs, which I believe is our single biggest problem that we have, it's, it dawned on me that there are more people out there that think like this than I thought that there were. Mm -hmm. I, d I just thought it was sex, drugs, rock and roll, that's all they care about, they don't want to know about anything else, and how wrong I really was. And this record is a serious record about serious subject matter, and I would really therefore like it to be very much to be taken seriously. Yeah, that's probably just the point of mm, So what about your actual live show, Black Have you tamed that down from... Well, Wasp will always do a big show. I mean, it wouldn't be Wasp without it, you know, but what we're going to do is, you haven't seen the album cover yet, and maybe we can get one around here somewhere, which you insert, but we're going to attempt to bring this album cover to life. So to say that we used to do things like the rack and all that before, what we're trying to get away from is something that's not do anything that's going to detract away from what we're doing musically. This time we let the music do the talking, mm. but we build the visuals into what's around the music mm. instead of having the visuals work against it where it's visual and just, you know, the music becomes a soundtrack to what yeah. we're doing visually. Chris, keyboards on the album, I mean, is it going to be the same wasp? Is it going to be as hard? As usual. <laughs> yeah, we take a keyboard player out on the road. Ken Hensley played on our album. Oh, you are eight, man. Yeah, it's real fun to work with the guy in the studio because he's like a pro, like the old John Lord sound, you know. I enjoyed working with him. How did you come across um, Ken? Uh, Johnny knew him from St. Louis. He'd played in a, what was it, riverboat bands or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. River, yeah. More like Riverboat Queen. <laughs> 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 There's yeah, a just kidding, guy. John. We always wanted to bring <laughs> keyboards in, mm. and uh, John, his name just came up, you know, because that's that old Leslie sound. And Blackie asked John, he goes, uh, yeah, you know, Ken Hensley, uh, call him up. So he called him up, and he came out, he rehearsed with us. What tracks did he play on? Yeah, well, he, he only seven. rehearsed two songs with us uh, initially, but we found that every day you know we keep rehearsing it sounded really good really good so pretty soon it ended up where he played an almost the entire yeah album. you yeah. just took the question away from des yeah no, no. <laughs> it's, good. It's, good. It's, good. it's a mind reader you know? well, we don't really need you here <laughs> yeah, yeah you carry know. on with this show it's yours. Yeah, we'll we'll take this show on for you <laughs> you're producing <laughs> wanting one you know <laughs> you're producing uh, your own know, album yes. don't you trust anybody else no, we're just greedy. <laughs> no. no, it's like, you know, most bands know what they want. They just don't know how to get it from the amplifier through the board onto the tape. And if you have a meager amount of experience, which I think is, that's how we could be qualified, uh, you get a pretty good idea of what you want and how you want to go about doing it. And if 
you're going to lose, you know, it's the old telephone game, you know, you lose something in the translation all the time if you don't have the the right guy there, you know, and then pretty soon the worm turns into the anaconda and God, mm. you've got a mess on your hands. Mm. Well, the album is a bit late coming to the MTV and the Bailey Brothers, but I heard there's a ballad, Forever Free, is that right? Yes. Uh, What's that about then, Black? Forever Black? Free is unfortunately a true story about someone who is very close to me, who is no longer with us, and from... Really, in all honesty, the song has no business being on the album because it's not as heavy or as aggressive as the rest of the album. This is the most aggressive European-sounding record we've ever done. I mean, it sounds in a lot of ways unlike anything we've ever done. But this song, like I said, is in some ways schizophrenic and doesn't really coincide with everything else that's going on, but it's something that I felt. And I've learned in the last few years you don't deny the feelings that you have inside of you, because I think I did that for too long. Somebody was asking me the other day, they said, describe yourself in one word, and I said, misunderstood, because people would see the image, and most people, because they never got a chance to talk to me, just assumed, you know, that, that the image was, was, you know, preceding everything before I ever walked into a room, and they thought I was going to lean over and start chewing on their nose or something. And I thought, well, it's time, because we've done all that, we've said all that, it's time to give them a little more insight as to what's really going on mm. here. That's a nice subject to carry on. I think we'll have a look at a video on Mick and then get back to some serious talking. Serious talking on the show today, folks. That's right. <laughs> Blinding Texas. Fancy this one? If you do. Right. Why not? Blinding Texas. <laughs> this We're is back. Check yeah, it yeah. out. Check it out.
So, did you check it out or did you check it out? <laughs> That's what we want to know. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Blackie, it must be um, a big decision to sort of change your music and change your um, your whole outlook on... I Well, he's always wanted to do heavier stuff than, than we've done. And we just got to a point where the subject matter was very serious. And I could not see doing a serious subject without having music that was equally aggressive to go with it. So at that point, we decided you had to do it. I think we had a little dissension on whether we wanted to use keyboards or not. But I, it was one of those things I said, just trust me on it, because I'm seeing the vision in my head as to what it sounds like. And, I, and it's changed it for the better, I think. Do you, do you agree with that, Chris? Do you, are you pleased with it now you have your keyboards? Yeah, I thought it'd be like Emerson, Lake, and Farmer or something, you know. Yeah. Which is not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I like the heavy set. They had, you know, just guitar, bass, and drums for that. Yeah. Guitar player, so, egomaniacal, yeah. I don't know how they are. 90% guitar and... Right. <laughs> well, no, no, you should hear his, his idea... <laughs> His idea of what a solo album is, 24 tracks, you take the drums, the bass, and vocals all on one wow. track, 23 <laughs> tracks of guitars, and you mix with a 2 by 4 But you've done uh, Mean Man, a tribute to Chris. What is well, I don't know if it's a tribute or not. It's just a, you know, it's like a, a reporter goes out on the street and does factual reporting, you know, when he comes in. I'm just really telling the story and making it rhyme. That's about it. And if you know this guy, then... You know, it's but it's so really unusual to have... You know, usually the tributes are right about somebody when they're dead. I mean, are you well, thinking Chris is dead? Like I, said, I don't think it's a tribute. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit quiet today, for me. <laughs> sometimes I'm dead. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, like I said, I don't think so much a tribute as it is just factual reporting, you know. Yeah. I'm getting my journalistic award for this one. You, you know. might do. Chris, we saw, when we was in the States, we saw the Metal Years. What's well, that? <laughs> it's a movie, It's right? a movie <laughs> where you, you're in it, obviously. We're mm -hmm. bouncing in the pond. He's, he's in a swimming pool. At... They called me to do a do an interview, and uh, it was supposed to be done on a Sunday, and I was partying to hell on a Saturday. <laughs> it all takes... <laughs> and then they called me up Saturday afternoon and says, guess what, you're not going to do it tomorrow. And I went, oh, well, why not? And they go, you can't do it today. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, I was out of my mind. And I went, <laughs> Like they're calling you from the car phone. Yeah, you know, we'll be there in five minutes. Yeah, I was yeah. just—I was already told. I said, "Okay, let's do it today." You know, so I came out mostly different than other people's interviews. You did, because everyone in the in the movie, everyone at the movies, were just falling off the seats, were laughing. You went down. Well, the stop. other guys were too serious in a way. <laughs>